I would like to introduce our MC for the day, Billy Costa. Billy is a television and radio host known throughout the Boston area. He's been a staple on KISS 108 for the past 30 years, which I realize uh, means that I was driving around listening to when I was a student at LS many years ago. I was listening to Billy on the radio. Um, and he's worked extensively with WBZ, Nesson, WGBH. He's in his third year. We're so pleased that he's in his third year of working with us as an ambassador for the Mass General Cancer Center. He's worked with us here, and he's helped uh, share everyday amazing stories on the air. And he's been the MC of our Everyday Amazing Race, which I encourage you to either run in or support or find someone who can run in it and support that in the fall. So without further ado, please help me welcome Billy Costa. Okay, well, thank you for having me. And as Jeff said, I've been working uh, with Mass General Cancer Center uh, with iHeartMedia and KISS 108 for about three years now, I guess. And uh, through my food radio show on BZ News Radio on uh, Sunday nights, by the way, at 6 o'clock, um, uh, we do everyday amazing feature stories each and every uh, Sunday night. I've had various clinicians. Uh, Jeff has been in studio. Uh, and uh, surgeons and experts uh, throughout the field. So I'm thrilled to be a part of that uh, partnership. My role here today is simply to kind of walk you through the various phases of uh, the conference uh, this afternoon. Uh, Lord knows the fact that you're all here means that you're looking for more advice, you're looking for more answers, you're looking for more information, you're looking to make things a little bit easier than maybe they uh, are right now. Uh, so I'll just walk you through the various phases. You're gonna meet some incredible people. Uh, you will gain a lot of knowledge by being here today. And thank you for sacrificing your time, especially on a beautiful uh, Saturday morning uh, here in uh, Boston. Uh, Dr. Gaynor is joining us today. I've met the doctor before. He's been on my show. He's an incredible human being. He's gonna talk about a cancer therapy called immunotherapy. Mara mentioned it right at the outset. Uh, here this morning. And while this uh, innovation is providing hope uh, for the treatment of certain cancers, it also uh, changes the way some patients approach what having cancer really means. Uh, and if you want to learn more, again, the speakers are happy to answer your questions, especially during the break. Uh, Dr. Gaynor is an attending physician in the Center for Thoracic Cancers at Mass General and also an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He currently serves as the director of targeted immunotherapy, immunotherapy in the uh, Henry and Belinda uh, Termeer Center for Targeted Therapies at Mass General Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Gaynor. So thanks so much, Billy, for the introduction. Uh, thanks to Mara, Jeff, Steve, for the invitation to be here. And, and thanks to all of you for, for making time on, uh, as we've already said, a beautiful Saturday morning. Um, you know, many of you, you know, may have already received immunotherapy or heard about it on TV or really uh, heard about it from friends, family members. Uh, th there, this really encompasses a very broad term. And so my, my goal today is really to provide you an overview of what, what immunotherapy means, why we're thinking about using it, uh, what is some of the uh, promise of immunotherapy, but also what are, what's some of the hype and what we're doing at Mass General to, to really push these therapies forward. And so I, I've broken this talk down, and I, I really want to make sure that we save time for questions. So I've broken this down into a little historical piece, um, just what, what's the history behind immunotherapy. I, I always learn better through stories. Uh, what's the promise? What's the hype? And then really, what's the future? So first, the history. Um, some of you may recognize this painting, anybody? 1891. This is uh, Sir Luke Fields. Um, and, and it's one of my favorite paintings because to me, I, I think this really captures the ethos uh, of uh, clinicians at MGH. Um, you know, this is a painting a long time ago now, but it's really focused on one provider with the family of a sick child. And, and to me, you know, when I look at this painting, it's really thinking about what more can I do? What, what can I do better? And I think this is really the heart of our mission here. Um, it's also a, an inspiration in the sense that uh, it, it also teaches us that sometimes the, this whole approach of, of just, you know, what can I do better? What can I do for a single patient can actually change not that 
not only that patient's lives, but, but actually change the world. And, and I, I bring that up because at the very same time, uh, across the Atlantic, uh, that actually happened. Um, and so in the 1890s, this is a picture of the young William Coley. So William Coley actually trained here in Boston. Uh, he was a surgeon. And uh, after his training, he moved to New York. And he came across uh, this young woman on the right. Uh, her name was Bessie Daschle. Uh, that young gentleman to her right, um, that was a, a young uh, John D. Rockefeller. Um, and so the story goes that uh, she was on the subway uh, or, you know, um, and got her hand caught in something um, and uh, developed a bruise um, or some, you know, some, some trauma to the hand, and it just wasn't getting better. What ended up happening was she saw various doctors at the time. Remember, this is you know, the 19th century. And um, finally, someone did a biopsy at the time, and it ended up being a, a, a sarcoma, or what they deemed a sarcoma in, in those days. Um, Coley was her surgeon, and he actually tried removing it. But unfortunately, she succumbed to her disease shortly thereafter. But this left such an impression on Coley. If you think back to that painting I just showed you, this, this was his patient, um, that he just perseverated on what could I have done better. And so he started asking all of his colleagues and you know, thinking about other patients who may have had similar forms of cancer and, and what they did and, and did they have better outcomes. And he heard about one case of a gentleman who had a cancer uh, that, that was on the skin who developed a bout of erysipelas, developed an infection um, uh, after a biopsy. And what was remarkable was that after that infection, the, the tumor started to regress. So it started to shrinking. And so Coley was fascinated by this. And he started, the, the story goes, he, he started scouring the lower tenements of Manhattan looking for this patient because the, the, this, this was years earlier. And he found this patient. It was, it was a German immigrant named Stein. And remarkably, he was still tumor free. And so this, this, uh, prompted, um, this prompted Coley to say, well, you know what? Was there something about the infection that, that stimulated the body's uh, immune powers. We didn't really understand, they didn't understand the immune system at the time, but there was something that he called the resisting powers. Was there something there that was stimulated by the infection uh, that, that he could harness therapeutically? And what Coley tried to do, um, he then said, well, why don't I give people infections? Um, he quickly learned that, you know, so he, he basically took bacteria and started injecting patients. This was before IRBs and rules governing <laughs> human research. Um, but but um, he, he quickly learned that you needed to inactivate, you needed to kill the bacteria before you gave it. Um, but, you know, he, he then wrote his fi findings down. And he did actually see sporadically, but, but results of, of actual, you know, tumor shrinking. Again, the, the, this is the 1890s. Okay, so he did see bouts and you know even made the the New York Times in 1908 um, it's really just but but this is why uh, Coley has been deemed the father of immunotherapy you know this is we, we tend to think of immunotherapy as this new thing but it but it's actually you know over a hundred years old Coley didn't really understand what he was doing but what he was really doing was he was trying to stimulate the immune system to attack the cancer um, now our understanding of this has gotten much better um, and, and I, I think a hundred years from now, uh, people may be, you know, looking at us and saying, well, because right now we're developing new immune therapies where we're polio virus, you know, herpes viruses and actually using them, you know, deactivating them, but, but using them. So we're using some of the same concepts of, uh, as Coley, um, just with a better understanding of the immune system. But, but what you need to recognize, this is really the central premise of immunotherapy, is, is this, that, that cancer cells often accumulate genetic mutations, misspellings in their DNA, that may generate um, basically new, new things on their surface that can be recognized by the, by the immune system. So basically, as you, as you move from left to right, 
as the cancer cells develop more mutations or more misspellings, it, it just begins to look more foreign to the immune system, and that's what's able to be recognized. Um, but a lot has to go into to actually going from that point to actually having your immune system recognize it. Because for the most part, despite those differences, cancer cells are 99% similar to, to the rest of your body. But why might this be important? Why might we want to target this therapeutically? Well, there are three key features of the immune system that I think you know, are, are really powerful. One, it's very specific. Two, it can adapt over time. And three, and this is the crucial one, it has memory. Think about vaccines that you received as a child. You know, many of those vaccines are still protecting you to this day. In some ways, I think of the immune system as like a boulder at the top of a, a big hill. Sometimes all you need is a little push, and, and that will just keep going. It, it has this capacity for memory. Now, I, I brought up the, the, the um, example of vaccines, and, and here's, uh, uh, many of you may recognize Jonas Salk, you know, uh, father of the, the polio vaccine. Um, and, and really, vaccines have been, the, I would arguably, the, the most kind of the greatest scientific breakthrough of the 20th century um, with respect to infectious diseases. Um, so clearly, you know, the immune system can be incredibly powerful. How can we then translate that same success and make it the greatest you know, uh, advance of the 21st century? Um, so initial efforts, again, this is on the historical piece, initial efforts have focused on cancer vaccines. And I would say these are the old vaccines. These are non-personalized. These are just generic vaccines. And unfortunately, um, many of the, most of these have failed um, because they're non-specific. Um, maybe during the question and answer session, I'll, I'll, I'll share some bits on we're now developed personalized vaccines, that is vaccines that are unique to each individual person and how we're seeing better results with that strategy. But, but the, the initial steps of trying to take infectious, our, our approach to infectious disease to cancer really was not successful. Um, likewise, when we tried, um, uh, this is an old piece now, um, you know, a lot of buzz using other kind of other nonspecific means to stimulate the immune system. This was from 1985. You know, uh, basically infusing the signals that our immune system uses, but again, non-specifically. Um, and uh, I'm not going to show a lot of statistics, but unfortunately, you know, this worked in a very small percentage of people, but but the, it resulted in really significant toxicity. Okay. So so what about now? You know, I've given you a hundred years worth of, of immunotherapy in five minutes. Um, what 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 is, what's, what's the, the current approach? Well, you know, just some, some uh, key players. First, the T cells. So these are really the soldiers of the immune system. So this picture here is, is in, uh, in red is a tumor cell, um, and then in blue are our immune cells. And you can see kind of the immune cells on top of the tumor cell. That's what we're, what, that's what we're after, um, basically allowing your immune system to recognize those tumor cells. Um, but it, it's not that simple, and our immune system is incredibly complex, and the example I, I commonly use is that of a car. Um, so on the left uh, is just a little schematic of, uh, of the immune cell, and on the right is, is um, a different type of cell. And, and basically, your immune system, think about it as having gas pedals and brakes, just like your car. So on the top um, you know, are the gas pedals. There's more than one, which makes things really complicated, and this is actually a simplified version. And below are the brakes, okay? And so many of the therapies that, that you've heard about um, or, or seen on TV are, are agents that are targeting the brakes, basically trying to block the brakes of the immune system. My, why might we do this? Well, um, in some ways, you know, uh, cancer is a, is a wolf in sheep's clothing how it, it basically evades the immune system in very specific ways. So, so basically, cancer can cloak itself in something that shuts off the T cell. And this is an example, this is, um, this is an example on, on the right, you know, a, a tumor that has cloaked itself in something that, that actually just shuts off the T cell when it's, when it's next to it. Um, so tumors are smart. 
And uh, what we've learned is that if we actually deliver drugs that block the break, suddenly it, it allows your immune cells to recognize, now suddenly recognize the, the, the tumor cell. And this has uh, led to profound results over the last several years. These are just uh, not meant to kind of see, but you know, the New England Journal is considered the premier journal, and I would say over the last uh, five years, the sheer number of publications on immunotherapies has, you know, is going up exponentially, uh, just speaking to the promise of, of these drugs. And, and um, I think this is something that gives me tremendous hope. This is um, a timeline of FDA approvals of immunotherapies. And you can see that you know, 2011, we have one drug, and now this is just going up exponentially uh, as we move from left to right. So we now have more FDA-approved immune therapies in more than 12 different cancers, and that number is expected to grow. I'm, I'm not going to share many, you know, I, I know anecdotes can, can um, you know, um, I don't want to rely heavily on anecdotes, but, but I think this is an example of a, a patient I saw in clinic on Thursday um, and, and speaks to the promise of immunotherapy. And, and many of you aren't familiar, but this is a CT scan. In, in red, I've, I've circled an area of the tumor. You can see the date here. This is June 2013. Uh, two months later, after starting immune therapy, we see significant shrinkage that, of, of that tumor. Two years later, you can see it's, it's still shrunk. And, and what's remarkable is that this patient actually stopped the drug in 2014. So remember, I, I was talking to you about this concept of memory, right? Um, so it's 2019, he's still off therapy. And I saw him in clinic this week, and we, we have no evidence of cancer. So this speaks to the, to the promise uh, of immunotherapy. Um, but it also speaks to the uncertainty Right? Because these drugs haven't been a lot around for very long. You know, this, this drug was just approved in 2015. So there's tremendous uncertainty from a patient perspective, a family perspective, and a provider perspective. I don't know what the long-term trajectory of these drugs are because they haven't been around long enough. And the field is moving so fast. You know, the clinical trial started 2013. No one in the world has the answers. Um, but that can create just that uncertainty is something that I think all of us are living with. But I also want to recognize, I, I don't want to stand up here on a soapbox and say, you know, immunotherapy is the greatest thing in the world because I do recognize that there is a lot of hype around this. And our patients are seeing this everywhere. I'm not advocating one drug or advertising anything. But, but you know, you're inundated with advertisements for various immunotherapies. Or, um, these are just examples of things you've seen uh, in commercials or billboards. And so there is tremendous hype around these drugs, too. I think part of it is because of that promise. I think there's a lot of hope within that, that potential for a more durable <laughs> therapy. Um, but we also recognize that, that actually um, these drugs don't work in everyone. And, you know, I'm, I'm a lung cancer doctor, and we, we know that if we look at across the board, um, only about 20% of people will have a significant response to these immunotherapies. Um, so part of our mission and part of my role is really how do we do better? You know, how, how do we improve upon those numbers? Um, and, and while also recognizing that, that these drugs um, uh, while they're better, far better tolerated than our typical chemotherapy, um, they also have side effects. Um, um, and I, if you go back to that analogy that I gave you of a, of a car, you know, gas pedals and brakes, well, Mother Nature put the brakes there for a reason, and we're, we're exploiting them. And so we know that with these drugs that, that suddenly um, we can... Uh, the immune system, instead of recognizing the tumor, or in addition to recognizing the tumor, can also recognize normal parts of ourselves as foreign. Okay? And really, this can affect anything from the head down to the toes. And so it's also uh, a brave new world for clinicians as well, just because these drugs have different side effects than, than what we've typically seen with other therapies. And so what I want to leave you with in the next five minutes is, is so what's the future? I could talk to you all day about this topic. It's, it's in, you know, there, there's so much here. But I just want to, 
share a couple things that, that we're doing here at MGH uh, to, to overcome the hurdles here. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about toxicity management, uh, the fact that these drugs are being moved to, to earlier stages of cancer, so-called after surgery or adjuvant treatments, biomarkers and combinations. So, you know, MGH, you know, I, I first came to MGH 15 years ago as a med student, and, and it is such a special place where you just have an expert in something right at your fingertips. And that extends to um, you know, toxicity management. And I think this is where MGH is particularly well suited because we're a general hospital, right? It's in our name. Um, and so what we've quickly learned with immunotherapies is that um, they rely on multidisciplinary care. Just one single doc, nurse practitioner, nurse can't manage this alone. It really requires having an expert gastroenterologist, an expert pulmonologist. And so having that all at our fingertips, fingertips at a world-class hospital is, is, is truly amazing. And this is just a a part of, we actually have a dedicated service now that's not just oncologists, it's really experts from every single uh, area of the hospital who are all coming together to try to understand immunotherapies better. We're also um, moving these drugs, these immune therapies, to, to earlier stages. Um, so Initially, these drugs were, were explored in the stage four setting. Um, we now have our first FDA approvals of these drugs as adjuvant therapy, so for, for non-metastatic cases after surgery. And we're leading a number of clinical trials actually looking at how do we actually use these drugs earlier. Uh, we're also leading major efforts to, to try to harness all the expertise in immunology and basic science here to, to identify, you know, can we do better at picking out, you know, who's more or less likely to respond to these drugs? And we're re le really leading a, a, a national effort uh, on this front right now. And, and the reason to do that is to really inform the next wave of clinical trials. And, and really, I think the, the major promise here is in, in combinations. Um, you know, I, I showed you examples of, of targeting one break on the immune system. Well, what happens if we target a gas pedal in a break? Um, or what happens if we combine a vaccine with a break uh, uh, inhibiting agent? Um, this is a, a slide that actually is now a couple years old. Every dot represents a clinical trial currently taking place in immunotherapy taking place in the United States. Um, if we did this now, it'd be off the screen. Um, so, but how do we actually um, rationally uh, identify what combinations are best? And I think we're particularly well suited here just really with, with the expertise of, um, basically we, we can't operate in silos. And I think that's one thing that um, is done so well here. There's so much cross-fertilization of ideas and I think that's really what's necessary, and that's really what's going to be pushing, pushing this field forward. And so I, I want to save a, a couple minutes for questions, but, but just to summarize, I know this is a, a high-level overview, but, but really immune, these immune checkpoint inhibitors, as they're called, have really reshaped a growing list of cancers. Um, I really do think that these are completely changing um, the trajectory of our patients, but and, and we're going to be moving these earlier in, in the course of treatment. But really, we have to also recognize that, that, that the benefits of these dr drugs don't extend to everyone. And we really need to then identify what are better combinations to, to push these agents forward. And so with that, I'm, I'm going to hold and, and happy to take any questions. Currently, the, the way the studies were done was you stopped after two years. Now, that's completely arbitrary. Right? Um, the, the immune system is complex, and the, you know, the, there's some thinking that if you keep pushing that boulder down the hill, suddenly um, it can create this feedback and it can be counterproductive. Um, <clears throat> I think this is an area that, that it's actually a, a, a long conversation between patient-physician about 
do we stop? Do we not stop? We, we just, there's tremendous uncertainty. Um, I think for this particular patient, he, he had encountered a side effect, which is what prompted us to stop. Um, but it's an example of you, you don't necessarily need to, to keep giving these drugs. And the drug is long out of the system, um, but those immune cells are still there. It's more that uh, they have survival instincts. And, and, and here you go back to Darwin, right? You know, it, it's not the strongest of a species that survives. It's the one that's best able to adapt. And so <clears throat> cancer cells can, can adapt to any pressure that, that you put on them. And so <clears throat> when, and we have examples of this where, where um, by giving the immunotherapy, um, you're recognizing those new antigens, those new things on their surface. What they can do is they can just start deleting them. Um, and, and it's just under that pressure. Um, so that's what I mean by, by they're smart. They, they're, they're just adaptable. What I didn't explicitly say but is important, um, uh, that list of FDA approvals, it's the same drugs being approved for different cancers. Um, and so there are some commonalities, though, in the tumors that uh, the, the cancers where these drugs are being approved. And one of those commonalities is um, they, they tend to be in cancers that have very high numbers of mutations. Um, so... Um, or misspellings in their DNA. And so, so they're, they're, you know, things like melanoma from a UV exposure, um, lung cancer. So, so cancers that tend to have a lot of mutations are, are more likely to, to look foreign to the immune system and more likely to then benefit from these, uh, these forms of immunotherapies. The drugs that, that block that PD-1, these checkpoint inhibitors, it's, it's like removing the, the wolf, uh, the sheep's clothing, in that the immune cells are already able to recognize the tumor normally, but the tumor's cloaking itself and preventing that from happening. There are, though, um, new approaches that, that we're, we're leading right now of trying to educate the immune system to suddenly recognizing, recognize things that it couldn't before. Um, and, and that's where I was getting at examples of like personalized vaccines. So um, I, I think I'll, I'll begin by answering, you know, first off, how do we, how do we treat the, the immune side effects. So, so these occur in about 20% of people. Uh, most of the time, the most common one involves the thyroid gland, and that, that's pretty straightforward um, uh, to treat. It's really replacing the, the hormone. Uh, but for everything else, it's really, we, we treat that by uh, giving medicines to dampen the immune response, so mainly steroids. <clears throat> You're right, though, that sometimes, um, and, and this is really a minority of people, um, uh, we're still giving um, immunosuppression. They're, they're still dealing with the effects of, of the immune therapy. And sometimes that, that can occur because the, the organ that's been affected, you know, um, you know like, the, like the thyroid or the pancreas, you may have heard of like type 1 diabetes where, where um, <clears throat> the immune cells really are, are affecting the function. Some of those can be long-term um, and... and Patients need to be on some form of therapy indefinitely, but it's it's a very small percentage of people. No, so so these drugs are approved now in, in more than twelve different cancers. So I would say the majority of patients receiving immune checkpoint inhibitors are actually receiving it just commercial drugs. You know, just the doc writing the orders and, and that's it. 